taste of Lent, and you will be seeing this, of course, during our Pascha, as May comes around here. What a miracle we have for you to see. What a miracle of the Lord's own making. This is the Lord of glory, glorifying us as he glorified himself and the human nature that he took on to restore. He is the second Adam. He was given flesh by his mother in a unique way. St. Simeon the New Theologian has descriptions of how this flesh was used that was unsullied by any sin because of the perfection of the virtue of the mother of the Lord as she was prepared for this in the temple of God. In a unique way, by the way. We'll have a program on that later, the life of the Virgin. Here's what our readings say. They put in the mouth of the Lord, Jesus Christ, the God-man, speaking to his mother. Remember the passion deeply affected her, that's her flesh. Saint Simeon, and along with Anna, when she was presenting Christ in the temple, remember, a sword shall pierce your heart. When you're looking upon your son, you shall share in his passion in a very incredible way. It would have destroyed any person that did not have the holiness that the mother of the Lord had and the oneness with her son, our God. Do not weep for me, mother, says her son. Although you see hanging upon the cross your son and God, who hung the earth upon the waters, fashioned the entire creation, do not weep, for I shall rise and be glorified with my divine power, I shall crush the kingdom of Hades. I will bring an end to the power of Satan and of his Hades and deliver from its wickedness all those who had been held captive in order to lead them to my Father in my great love for them. You have redeemed us from the curse of the law by your precious blood. Ah, the law was also a curse. Our Protestant friends need to know that Judaism was a heavy burden and the Lord lifted the law and their so sin was forgiven by his precious blood, by being nailed to the cross and wounded by the lance from which whose side the blood and water poured forth with the Eucharist, the baptism, all of those forgiveness of sin. You have become for us the fountain of immortality to heal the death that we brought on ourselves by sin. You have become for us the fountain pouring forth of immortality. Our Savior, glory to you. Looking at the immolation freely suffered. And so we come to the end of the Passion. Now we see the relic of the resurrection trumpeted by the holy angels. Saint Gabriel is there, waiting for the women to come. Anticipating the dawn, the women came with Mary and found the stone rolled away from the sepulcher and the angel Gabriel seated upon it. Why do you seek among the dead? He spoke to them. As though he were mortal, him who lives in everlasting light, light. 
the radiance you will see is from the light imprinted on the relic of the shroud. Listen to this. Behold the grave clothes. Look at them, laid aside by a living person, not riffed off like thieves would do. Behold the cloth, the grave cloth. Go quickly. That's the second command. The first command, behold the grave clothes. Look at them carefully, which we are doing now. And go, the second command of the angel from God, go quickly and proclaim to the world, not only to the apostles, but to the world that the Lord is risen and has killed, he has slain death. For he is the Son of God who saves mankind. This is from the Epikoi in the Resurrection Pascha hours. Friends, I'm doing the best I can to be one of those women who is looking at this evidence. And I'm telling you, the world, we are at the end times. He has left us a time capsule which can only be understood fully by us with the technology of today. They venerated it in Edessa. They venerated this beautiful shroud in Constantinople, in one of the secondary churches where it could be kept hidden away from um, most eyes. It was venerated on Fridays to commemorate his holy passion. Then it was taken by crusaders as they looted everything. One of the Knights of the Templars who was vowed to poverty, chastity, and obedience hid it away in his satchel along with other relics, unfortunately, that he stole. But he took it to France, his home country, and built a special chapel for this. We will go to the video that records the new discoveries made possible by 3D photography and motion photography with the application of the physics of movement so we can record what happened in the resurrection. That's the kind of proof that we could only prove here in our own time. It was venerated in the past as it should have been, but now with full knowledge of the implications of what he went through in the Passion, recorded by every wound in that shroud, the fulfillment of the prophetic words of Isaiah especially. And then the fulfillment of the resurrection in the glory of a light so intense we can only compare it to one kind of emanation of light so that it's so focused it burns. But not altogether. Miracles abound here. The laser light only grazed less than a hair width. It's the top of the linen cloth in order to impress the image correctly and make it visible to our eyes. And to our eyes today that have so much ability to discover what is in the mystery of this shroud. I will tell you more about the physics of the movement recorded in the shroud 
after this episode from YouTube called Evidence of the Shroud of Turin. And there's a date given you must, when you're looking for this, include the date 2021. That's the end of the title, their own. Mm. A hint, it's stolen property, like most of the things in their museums in Europe and in the Vatican museums. But that's all right. It was kept safe by an honest crusader knight of the Templars who kept his vow and who, by the way, died at the stake keeping this vow. Let's look at the history in a short view. Then we will see the YouTube video and watch carefully. I'm giving highlights from it. Watch with faith and most of all with love for Christ. As the French woman says in this beautiful tape, he looked at me with such love from the shroud. It was like he was waiting for me to open the doors of my heart. He is a God that is a beggar for our love. Oh, let us approach the beautiful worship of the Passion to Orthodox Christians and the wonderful glory of the Resurrection. May God allow us to share it as we know more about what he went through for us and the great love to which he wants us to respond by giving our whole heart and life for the glory here and for the glory of his name in the kingdom of God as we carry it forth in this world into the next. It is laid on the altar, and all the holy gifts are laid upon it. As the Epiclesis invocation of the Holy Spirit is read over the holy bread and the holy wine, we ask the Holy Spirit to take these, this body, this bread to make it the body of Christ, and this blood to make it into the chalice of his blood and creating it thus, making it thus by the Holy Spirit. Now this is said, I'm telling you here, tie it to the divine liturgy of our Eastern Apostolic Orthodox faith, continuing this tradition. The antimons lay on the altar, the bread and the wine are there as we ask the Holy Spirit to come down upon them. And the priest takes the bread and joins it to the wine. Over from an icon painted from this time when he was in the linen cloth, was laying down in a box and brought up to be revealed by those who are venerating him. Worshiping his cross, his three days in the tomb in which he visited Hades and his deified soul to raise them and defeat the devil under our feet as the second Adam and as the God of glory raising his human nature to be with us forever as the God-man and seated at the right hand of the Father in his deified human nature, both God and man. Glory to thee, O Lord, we are overflowing. Let your joy overflow in this Pascha as we celebrate the complete victory you have over everything in this life. You are our reward. Thank you, O Lord.
Thank you, Lord. Help us to serve you worthily. Thank you. The Shroud of Turin is a 14-foot linen cloth that is believed to have wrapped the body of Jesus Christ after his crucifixion. The statue is a three-dimensional representation in actual size of the Man of the Shroud, created following the precise measurements taken from the cloth. Giulio Fanti, a professor of mechanical and thermal measurements and a scholar of the Shroud of Turin, used his own measurements of the impression on the shroud to create the carbon copy. Professor Fanti has studied the shroud for the last 20 years and led the research team that created the 3D model of Jesus. Based off the model, they are able to tell he was nearly 5 feet 11 inches tall whereas the average height at the time was around 5 feet 5 inches tall. Researchers believe that they finally have the precise image of what Jesus looked like. And based on the marks on the Shroud of Turin, Jesus received a total of at least 600 blows. The, the Shroud is encoded with 3D information that is found from the spaces between the highest and lowest points of the body and its distance from the cloth. Recently, a VP8 analyzer that gives topographical information about the Moon and Mars terrain was used on the cloth. A 3D holographic image was formed of the face and body. An artist then used the exact dimensions of the 3D shroud image to create a bronze replica of the physical form of Jesus Christ. We have real blood proven scientifically. We have an image that's neither painted nor photographed nor scorched nor rubbed or in any way made by the hand of a man. The image on the shroud is definitely not manufactured, meaning made intentionally to fool us. This shroud has been wrapped around the body of a man who was tortured, flagellated, crowned with thorns, crucified at the time of the Roman Empire. All of which corresponds to what the Gospels tell us concerning Jesus. 
The Shroud of Turin provides a great challenge for science. It's a challenge because it's a piece of cloth that contains an image with physical properties unlike any other image I have ever seen or anyone has ever seen. I have spent 32 years studying it. 32 years, half my life studying it, and yet I still don't have the answers. The man I worked with from Los Alamos called me again and he said, Barry, what do you know about the Shroud of Turin? And I laughed. I said, but I'm Jewish. <laughs> and he said, me too. He was also Jewish. And he said, and explained to me that at that point, a, uh, a number of scientists had taken a photo of the shroud and he said they were so amazed that this image has such properties, they were going to put together a team of scientists to see if they could get permission to go to Turin and examine the shroud to try and determine how this image was formed. About two months into the project, I remember saying to one of the other team members, what is a Jewish boy like me doing on this? And he laughed and he said, you forgot that the man on the shroud is Jewish? And I said, no, I know this, I know. And then he gave me the best advice, maybe, of my whole life. He said, Barry, go to Turin, do the best job you can do God doesn't tell us in advance what the plan is, but one day you'll know. And this was great advice. And that kept me on the team. I was going to quit. But because of his words, from God maybe, through his lips, I stayed on the team. But the most important property of the Shroud's image is the fact that the distance between the cloth and the body made the density of the image change. So the closer it was, the darker the image. The further away, the lighter the image. So the image on the shroud is not just from contact, because it worked at a distance from the body. So the correlation of cloth to body distance yielded different densities of the image. So when we looked at it with the VP8, we saw the natural relief of a human form. Now how do we make images like that? We cannot duplicate this. And this three-dimensional information is the only image in the world that has this property. This image imprinted on the shroud was revealed in even more detailed relief in 2005 when it was transformed into a three-dimensional image. This was achieved by Dr. Soons, a doctor in Panama in Central America who specializes in three-dimensional imaging. The thing that stopped me from accepting the Shroud of, as authentic for years, 18 years, the blood on the Shroud is still red. Old blood should be black or brown. And no one could answer for 18 years, why is the blood on the Shroud still red? And then in 1995, in a telephone conversation with Dr. Alan Adler, Jewish blood chemist who proved, by the way, the blood on the shroud was blood. Proved it. He and I were on the telephone just having a conversation. And then he told me something I'd never known before. When someone is tortured over an extended period of time, 24 hours, 36 hours, right around the time of Jesus' torture, the body goes into shock. Jesus was given no water, he was beaten, he was scourged. Consequently, he went into anaphylactic shock. After a period of time in this type of shock, 
the cell walls of the red blood cells begin to break down. And the liver floods the body, the bloodstream, with an enzyme called bilirubin. And when that happens, the blood stays red forever. And when I found that out, that was the last piece of the puzzle. And that pushed me over the threshold and allowed me to accept the shroud as authentic because it gave me a scientific, credible answer. The clues that had been brought to light by the scientific research now made a medical examination of the image on the shroud possible. This examination revealed that this man had indeed been subjected to torture and that he had died by crucifixion. We don't see a man that's just dead. We see a man whose face is swollen because his face was beaten. And you can actually see one cheek is more swollen than the other, but both are. There are scourge marks from a Roman flagrum, which was a whip with three leather thongs, and at the end of each was a lead weight that shaped like a dumbbell uh, that weightlifters use. And his body is covered with these scourge marks, over 120. In flagellation, as applied by the Romans, the blows not only tore the skin, but, as a result of their energy, which was absorbed in a few microseconds, they caused extremely serious internal lesions. It is truly a horrible torture. This was a man who, at the end of the scourging, was going to die. His kidneys had ceased to function, he was losing liters of blood, he was completely dehydrated. The man on the cross had no more than a few hours left. More amazingly, those crucifixion wounds in the hands, blood stains covering his head as if from a cap or crown of thorns. But not the beautiful things that the artists show us. Oh, the Roman soldiers were not going to take the time to weave a beautiful crown. They took a bush of thorns and smashed it onto his head, causing bleeding all over his head. Every thorn that touched his flesh would have been like an electric shock for a few seconds or even several minutes. We can hardly imagine this when we read in the Gospels, they crucified him. And we see a wound on his side. The darkest blood stain on the entire shroud is from this wound. and the blood actually went around to his back. So we have this bloody cloth with all these wounds, and it is a perfect match to what it tells in the Gospels was done to Jesus. This is Jesus. This is his testimony. Here is what I have done for you. Here is what the Gospels say. Here is what I am saying. I confirm them. Here is what I have done. I was completely overwhelmed because a naked body, which had been tortured with traces of blood which were only too visible, should really have made me want to run away. But funnily enough, this was not what I saw. 
I saw a body, more than just a body, a person who seemed infinitely reassuring, filled with peace. And this wave of peace reached out to me too. And I received a very deep and indelible certainty, as though he was right in front of me, and he said to me, Don't worry, suffering does not have the last word. Death will not swallow you up. I've been there before you. I could say that I met him. I could say, like Froissart, he exists, I've met him, this Jesus of 2,000 years ago. I can say that I've seen him face to face. And this wave of peace, I have to say that it's... The Word was made flesh, the Logos. He who is is the Word. He who is the truth, the life, he assumed a human body. He has placed himself within our reach so that we can reclaim our dignity. Surely it is our grief that he himself bore, our sorrows which he carried. It's as though he took the worst upon himself in order to allow us to breathe again and to continue to live after our difficulties and trials. He alone is able to transform our suffering. And the risen body came out of this fabric of death. And in the same way, he invites us to this same resurgence, this resurrection, and he shows us that we don't have to remain in the depths, but that his presence alone is itself a reassurance and can overcome anything. His hands are very beautiful. When I think that these are the hands which multiplied the lobes, which blessed the children and touched the blind, I see a man who is respectful, who is afraid of making me afraid. Because God is a little shy. He's shy because he's a beggar for our love. Our God, who is all-powerful, who could make the galaxies dance, is poor before me because he is waiting until I am ready to open my door for him. This information, or the fact that the shroud's image is a photographic negative, was discovered in 1898 and marked the beginning of a long series of photographic and data processing research. Therefore, the negative was the first step towards discovering another important characteristic, that of its tridimensionality. This means that the variations in luminosity that we can see on the shroud's image represent the characteristics of the tridimensionality of a face. This concept of tridimensionality had already been aired many years ago in 1902 by Paul Vignon who was one of the most important and famous experts on the Shroud. However, it was necessary to wait until 1977 to see that when some processing typical of NASA was applied to the Shroud's image, the first three-dimensional images of the face and body appeared. In 78, Italy also saw the institution of a research group studying the Shroud's image led by Professor Tamburelli, 
and the data processing methodology employed gave rise to a very particular three-dimensional image, an image with detail that emphasizes that we are effectively dealing with the face of a man that had been beaten. Some marks of torture are visible that correspond to what we read and is said in the Gospels. Therefore, tridimensionality is another important aspect. But this too is hidden information. As hidden information, there is that relative to foreign bodies, to foreign objects that have been thought to be present on the shroud's image. In particular, we can mention, for example, the imprint left by the coins. What you can see is a three-dimensional elaboration of a coin on the right eyelid that has left an almost unequivocal imprint, the presence of a question mark, and a part of the words Tiberioi Kaiseros. This, therefore, is a coin dating from 30 AD, and this would be a sort of intrinsic dating. Joining up with one of the few people in the world to actually have examined the shroud by hand, he discovered that clue in the cloth, the three-dimensional image. There's something missing, and that's what was the shape of the cloth when the exposure was made. We had to provide that and complete the data set. So with computers for the documentary, they have now recreated how the shroud would have been draped around the body. He says their 3D imaging reveals so much blood on the body. The amount of blood we found in the Shroud of Turin was extraordinary, beyond what I had envisioned. It's very dramatic to see. He was brutalized and murdered many times over. The face of the man in the Shroud was scarcely visible until a startling photographic negative was produced. But there is an additional, inexplicable property of this image which caught the attention of 3D computer graphics artist Ray Downing. Encoded within the fibers of this cloth, is 3D information which shouldn't be there. It's as if someone, using an unknown technology, hid a blueprint for constructing a three-dimensional statue within this two-dimensional image. Downing worked for over a year extracting and refining this encoded information to create that statue to reveal for the first time the face of the man in the shroud. This new portrait of Jesus drew worldwide attention in the news media and was the subject of a History Channel special. Inspired by quotes from the New Testament, Downing has gone on to illustrate a library of Jesus portraits based on the Shroud of Turin image, a face both hidden and revealed in time. Suffer little children, and forbid them not to come unto me. Lazarus, come forth. O my Father, if it be possible, let this cup pass from me. If the world hates you, you know that it hated me before it hated you. Father, into thy hands I commend my spirit. Greater love hath no man than this, that a man lay down his life for his friends. I am the resurrection and the life. My kingdom is not of this world. From somewhere there emerged three-dimensional information. To these practical scientists, it was as if they were looking at something from another planet. None of them had ever seen anything like this before. The VP-8 was the catalyst that caused the formation of the STIRP team. They said, we should see if we can figure out how this image was formed. Right. Peter Schumacher was a field engineer for the team that created the VP-8, which was originally designed to analyze images from medical resources and satellites. Nobody in our company had ever even heard of the Shroud of Turin, let alone seen pictures or wanted to look at image analysis of the Shroud of Turin. What the VP-8 analyzer does is plot the light and dark areas of an image onto a 3D grid. The nose has a prominence. The cheeks roll off. The hair 
has a, a shape to it and is rounded. The uh, whole image has dimension to it. The shroud is a very unique image, the only one of its kind in the whole world. Nothing else like it. Three-dimensional relief, the front and the back of a whole human being. Only one in the world, no other. There are other striking anomalies as well. For example, it has long been known that in addition to the explicit detail of the body image, there are also other images that were somehow transmitted onto the fabric, specifically the image of flowers. I first noticed the image of flowers on the shroud in 1985. And uh, when I found what they looked like, uh, then I began uh, looking more closely and uh, found that there were large numbers of, of these. I contacted Professor Avinoam Danin, the world's authority on the flowers of Israel, and uh, took some of our photographs out there. When I handed the photograph uh, that I'd uh, first spied the flowers on to him without indicating what we'd actually found, uh, he uh, looked at it for about 15 seconds and said, those are the flowers of Jerusalem. He immediately knew that this was a unique finding. But once it was discovered that there were other images on the shroud, Dr. Wanger began looking closer and found that there were small coins on each eye. What significance could that possibly have? Dr. Alan Wanger, in his book, The Shroud of Turin, Adventure and Discovery, points out that not only are they there, they present distinct and profound clues as to the date and origin of the image. Father Francis Phyllis was professor of the theology as well as a, uh, a, uh, a scientist uh, who investigated the Shroud of Turin as well as a photographer. He was working with a group of researchers who were attempting to identify uh, what the projections over the eyes were, thinking they might be coins. And uh, Dr. Phyllis uh, had uh, enlargement and made of the excellent photographs he had of the shroud and noticed the patterning uh, over the right eye. On enlargement of this, uh, he noticed that there were letters which he interpreted as U-C-A-I and something that looked like a shepherd's crook. This is typical uh, of uh, the uh, leptin or the uh, widow's mite struck by Pontius Pilate uh, in uh, the years uh, in 29 AD to 33. We can identify the, the images of them, and so we can identify the particular coin and uh, know the origin as well as the date, which both of them are, uh, that we identify are struck in 29 AD. So this uh, dates the shroud uh, back to the first century. It also localizes it to Israel, since the, these uh, coins are just the widow's mites or the common penny of the time, and certainly would not circulate either outside of Israel or not very long, after the reign of Tiberius Caesar, to which they were dedicated. But how could an image containing so much information have been formed? There are those who believe the image could only have been formed by a burst of some sort of radiation. But the simple fact is, nothing like the shroud image has ever been found or reproduced. But that's only the beginning of the astounding information to be gleaned from this amazing image. Because it's got three-dimensional properties, and x-ray properties, uh, the three-dimensional properties in particular cannot be reproduced by anybody today. Nobody on planet Earth can put three-dimensional properties into a two-dimensional cloth. The Shroud of Turin is unique on planet Earth. I believe that the Shroud of Turin proves the resurrection of Jesus Christ and that the image on the Shroud was caused by a burst of radiation given off at the uh, resurrection of Jesus Christ. Right, we're going to start with image 46. Those of you who've been, that is very, very significant. All right, let's read from scripture. Matthew 20, 18. Behold, we go up to Jerusalem and the Son of Man shall be betrayed unto the chief priests and they shall put him to death and shall deliver him to the Gentiles to mock and to scourge and to crucify him and on the third day he shall rise again. All right, now let's compare to what's written in scripture to the forensic evidence on the Shroud of Turin and see if it matches up. No less than seven forensic pathologists confirm without doubt that a genuine person made contact with the Shroud. He was dead, he was mocked with a crown of thorns, 
he was scourged and he was crucified and there's no evidence of decomposition on the shroud meaning that the body that was in there was not there very long less than three days we know for a forensic fact a man in the shroud was dead the knees are in a locked position from rigor mortis who buries someone with their knees raised unless the body was in rigor mortis and you were in a hurry to get the body in the tomb just like the historical record in the burial of Jesus there's a post-mortem side wound that's a no-brainer that means the person is dead first stage of rigor mortis is what the eyelids the neck and the jaw stiffen up and you can see on the man in the shroud his jaw is stiff it's locked up I mean you can see visible teeth and the final clue the slightly swelled stomach that doesn't happen until 48 hours after death so the man in the shroud has been dead for 48 to 72 hours and then his body was risen during the image process so this matches the whole passage right from the beginning the man in the shroud he's mocked he's scourged he's crucified he died and on the third day he rose he was risen that is what the forensic evidence says happened in order to have distance information on the shroud to have colored versus uncolored fibers which represents the distance the body was to the cloth at the time the image was formed that means what that means the body had to be raised off the ground there had to be a separation between the cloth and the body and that means risen so the man in the shroud was risen after three days Bear in mind, the blood stains are first and the image is over the blood stains. They are two separate events and the forensic evidence tells us that this image process took place 48 to 72 hours after the blood made contact with the cloth. Those are the forensic facts of the case file and they are indisputable anyone in disagreement is in disagreement with no less than seven forensic pathologists and blood chemistry experts we know for a forensic fact wrapping a dead body in linen will not leave an image behind on the cloth we have over a thousand burial cloths from antiquity that had bodies in them not a single one has an image on it except this one and that's because this body and this linen was resurrected what this really is is a two plus blank equals four type challenge and only one answer fits the only person this can be is Jesus Christ he's the only person in history we know of that was mocked scourged crucified died placed in an expensive linen and told people previously he was going to be risen on the third day and that is exactly what the forensic evidence says happened in this case Jesus himself said this evil generation keeps asking me to show them a miraculous sign but the only sign I will give to them is the sign of Jonah now look at the right side of the man of the shroud on his forehead what is that that's the sign of Jonah it's also on the heel on his heel on the back of the head and on the sedarium Oviedo four different times I've never seen in any crime photo in the history of my life or any morgue photo blood take on the shape of number three and be on the side of a head or on clothing or on tools or weapons or a blood splatter on walls or whatever it is I've never seen it I do not believe it is a coincidence Ladies and gentlemen, we are looking at the sign of Jonah on the Shroud of Turin. Beyond any reasonable doubt, beyond any doubt, the man on the Shroud is Jesus. The Shroud has properties of a photo negative, an x-ray photo, and a hologram, both a transmission hologram and a reflection hologram but yet is neither it is not a hologram it is not an x-ray photo it is not a photo negative it is a combination of those three things so the shroud image is what a photographic x-ray holographic image that said how many other dead bodies have left a photographic x-ray 
holographic image behind on a burial cloth or linen as a result of making contact with it. None. So this argument, well, that could have been any person in that cloth. The Romans scourged and crucified a lot of people. Uh, that argument doesn't fly at all. We could take one million different dead bodies right now, all scourged, crucified in the exact manner of the man in the shroud. Pour myrrh and aloes over the bodies, wrap them in every kind of fabric ever known to mankind, and we will never get an image like we see on the Shroud of Turin. So we have established a very important forensic fact. What is that fact? Putting a dead body, wrapping it in linen, will not leave an image like the Shroud behind. The only image that you would have would be the blood stains as a result of body to cloth contact. There's not going to be a thin, superficial image over those blood stains, say the least. There is only one thing that we know of on this earth that matches all these four unique characteristics. What is that? UVB rays in the UV spectrum at a very specific speed matches all of these characteristics. And that is not a coincidence. UV light in the UVB range will cause rapid aging in skin, dehydration, oxidation, meaning a chemical reaction takes place and causes your skin to turn a sepia color, a tan. And it only affects the superficial layers of your skin. Note there is a difference between sunlight and laser light. The UV light source making contact with the shroud is traveling at the same speed as UV light from the sun, but it is a different type of light. It is light of a single wavelength, which is a fancy way of saying laser light, versus sunlight, which is light photons spread out in all directions. And in fact, it would color all the fibers. It wouldn't leave some fibers colored and others uncolored. So light from the sun would not, is not responsible for the shroud image. Immediately eliminate sunlight and camera obscura as being capable of producing an image like the shroud. There are 200 fibrils and one fiber of linen. Only one of them has been colored, leaving the other 199 completely untouched. And that is because those linen fibers were exposed to UV light, laser-like light of a single wavelength, made contact with the fiber. It also caused it to become dehydrated. And a chemical reaction took place, causing it to turn a sepia color. And because it's UV light of a very specific speed in the UVB range, it only affected the superficial layers of the fabric. I just described how the shroud of turn linen fibrils were colored. Congratulations, you just learned in part, notice I said in part, how the image on the shroud was formed. Beyond any doubt, a higher power intelligence slash God is involved in the image process. This creator really went all out doing this image, photographic x-ray holographic image around the head from a thistle plant that only grows in Jerusalem. He scourged and crucified. That's a contradiction. If the Romans scourged people like they did in the Man of the Shroud, that was routine procedure, they would have been nailing dead corpses to crosses. This is the most hated person in the city and he's wrapped in fine linen. A body crucified and scourged to this degree would be thrown into a landfill, as in human garbage, not treated like a king. So this person has, he has rich friends. And that follows the gospel account. And there came also Nicodemus, who first came to Jesus by night and brought a mixture of myrrh and aloes, about a 100 pound weight. That would be extremely expensive. It would never be used on an ordinary criminal. There's evidence of myrrh and aloes on the head cloth in Spain. Myrrh and aloes found in the blood by antibody antigen testing by a forensic pathologist. See, all these are all clues that say the same thing. This man is Jesus. He's loved and he's hated, and he has what? He has rich friends, like Joseph of Arimathea and Nicodemus. On the cloth is a first century style stitching pattern. That gives us a clue as to the age of the cloth. The shroud is eight by two cubits, an ancient measuring system. The image goes against how people would perceive that God would do things. When one thinks of the almighty powerful, as a result, you see in all the early frescoes, Jesus has his eyes open and they're portrayed as big owl-like eyes because that's what it looks like. 
So we haven't even really seen the Shroud of Turin correctly until the last 118 years.